who's uh, taking a transcription of this event, which is uh, going to go up on the BCSEA website, I understand, so you can access that or direct people to that uh, if you wish. Um, I want to just give the format, or we, we, do the, we go over the format uh, for the questions. Um, we're going to ask you to keep the questions to 30 seconds, and the stop sign, uh, the racket is going to go up after those 30 seconds, so uh, finish your sentences up quickly then. And we'd like to give you, uh, you to give your name, and try to stay within the scope scope of the topic, although I know we'll um, kind of go around a bit probably. The candidates will have one minute each to respond. There will be no rebuttals. And you can address your candidate to one or all candidates, but if you address it to one, uh, the others also have the option of answering. And I'm going to move between uh, written and verbal questions. And of course we won't get to everybody, but we do have until 9 o'clock, so we're going to be able to have some, some good conversation here. So, um, everyone's clear on the guidelines, yes? Yeah. So there's a collect, uh, wave it higher, someone wants their question collected up here. She's coming, in the third row. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's take the first question from the mic. Hi there. My name is Glenn Adams, and I wish to ask Elizabeth May, what are the implications with Mr. Harper's TPP uh, next gen uh, suing us for billions if uh, we don't put through a pipeline uh, to the coast? Thank you. Glenn, thank you. Excellent question. The Counter-China Investment Treaty binds future Canadian governments until the year 2045. There is no way out of it unless Beijing agrees to allow us to renegotiate. For details, pick up a copy of Professor Gus Van Harten's book, Sold Down the Yangtze. What we need to do is be prepared for the horror of this in the next parliament. We need to pass legislation that requires any pressure for Beijing on Canada on any issue related to our laws under the SIPA to be made public, and we need to be prepared to write a check to the People's Republic of China in order to protect our laws and our sovereignty. It's not a happy answer, but the only way that we're going to be able to bring back the Fisheries Act, to bring back the Environmental Assessment Act, is to have politicians with the backbone to be prepared to fight these things through arbitration, and if we lose, write a check to have our laws back and say no to pipelines. Would either of the other candidates like to address that question? Thank you. Don't say no to every pipeline. This is, we need pipelines. How do you think no, you got here today? Do you think the oil just Popped up? No. It made it to shore. It was taken in tankers and brought here. It got to the coast by pipeline. We don't want our uh, our oil and our gasoline being shipped by rail. We've seen what happened. Just ask the mayor of Lake if she would like that. Uh, and on the China deal, well, it, it's such a secretive deal that. Most of us don't have any clue of what it says. And in the Liberal government, that won't happen again. Yeah, the uh, question of TPP, the uh, NDP recognizes that we are a trading nation and it is an important aspect. And, uh, but we're going to do that without um, risking our, uh, our communities and their ability to um, protect the environment and to protect ourselves. So um, the, uh, I, I believe Mr. Leclerc um, announced today that uh, should TPP be signed uh, before the election, he would move to uh, reverse that. Thank you. No follow-ups. Um, I've been handed three questions. 
uh, one for each candidate. And uh, these are directed specifically to those candidates, so they will be the only person to uh, address them. And um, the first one is from uh, someone whose name looks like Rita Conway. Uh, Elizabeth, you recently set out a campaign leaflet which claimed that the Conservatives were certain to lose the election to the NDP and that everyone could vote Green without fear of splitting the vote. <laughs> Latest polls say the Conservatives are likely to win and may be within range of another majority. Oh, Please no. explain. Well, we did send out a leaflet that said that the NDP were likely to form government. We did send out a leaflet that said Stephen Harper couldn't form government, and here's why. Even the most optimistic polls that show some increase at the moment in conservative support show them at least 20 seats short of a majority. Now, that's the most optimistic range. Bear in mind these are going up and down. The one thing that virtually everyone is certain of is going to be a minority parliament. In a minority parliament, I'm calling the Governor General as soon as the election is over to make sure he understands that if the Conservatives happen to have one or two more seats than the other parties, maybe five or six more. In a minority, Stephen Harper has not won an election. You have to hold the confidence of the House under our system of government. I'll make it clear to the Governor General that the opposition party leaders need to talk to put together a government that will hold the confidence of the House because there's not, a, as Mr. McCair says, not a snowball's chance in hell, he'll support Mr. Harper. So let's move fast to make sure he can't form government. Just to share the challenge, this question is for you. Okay. Many of the answers to the six questions sound very similar. This is all part of one question, that's why I'm doing them all at once. As government, the left sounding liberals govern like the conservatives. Why should we trust the liberals when they make these promises at election time? <laughs> okay, third question. Not all promises are kept in the past, I know that. I've been in government and I've been a voter for a long time. But there's something different about Justin Trudeau. He's honest. And what we know. <laughs> What we know is that he's honest enough to say he's going to run a deficit budget. This, you know, in this day and age, that might be considered political suicide. But you know something? Honesty is what it's about. I trust this person and I believe that we will keep the promises that we're making in this election because we have the confidence to run a deficit if we need to and to get Canada working again. Thank you. Part three of this question is for the NDP. And, oh, I just removed the question. I'm going to that. Why did Mulcair withdraw from the CBC English language debate? <laughs> well, I haven't had that conversation with Mr. Mulcair, so I can't necessarily speak for him. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, my my assumption would be that he's applying for the job of Prime Minister and he wants to um, debate the Prime Minister and I think the fact that he wasn't going to be there um, probably had something to do with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My question is about the mechanics of the election itself. I ran three times out here, and I just happened to run into somebody who previously voted uh, the Conservatives here, Lady Hunter. This was not arranged. <laughs> Ms. May, congratulations if you did be a Conservative. The problem is, though, I cannot understand why it is that your party seems to be targeting sitting ADP MPs. Yes. Like one Victoria and Mr. Gar Garrison in his I mean. If you would, if you did your candidates to do what you did, up by them and saw where they may win. Please. In general, in this election campaign, number one, I was the only party leader who tried to get Mr. Mulcair and Mr. Trudeau to talk about cooperation before the election. I offered to back off of Victoria if they were willing to provide any support at all for making sure that debates were fair. Mr. Mulcair wasn't interested. We're running very hard right now against Stephen Blaney. 
in Quebec. We're running very hard right now against Pierre Poilievre outside Ottawa. We're running very hard right now against Gail Shea, PER, Fisheries Minister. We are not targeting sitting NDP MPs. We are running to win seats where we have our best opportunity and our strongest green vote. And that's Vancouver Island where there's not a single chance of a Conservative MP winning the seat.
within the government? Well, the, the way to have respect for elected First Nations MPs is to encourage more First Nations people to participate and run for office. I'm really proud of the fact that of the seven ridings on Vancouver Island of Green Party candidates, two are incredible First Nations women. I hope they will serve in Parliament with me. For Anne Hutchinucci and Cowich and Bala Hat Langford and Brenda Sayers, who led the charge against the Canada China Investment Treaty, who's running in North Island Powell River. Jeannie Parnell is running for the Green Party in Skeena Buckley Valley. She's also First Nations. We have other candidates across the country. The Liberal Party is also very proud to have 14 First Nation leaders as our candidates across the country. Here, uh, um, some of you may know Judy Wilson Rabel, Rabel Wilson, who was the chief of the BC Assembly of First Nations. She's our candidate in Vancouver. So I think we're off to a good start. And the more First Nations and Aboriginal peoples we can elect to Parliament, the better it will be for all of us. Well, the NDP, of course, has had a long history of um, trying to involve as, uh, as many um, representations on, from the community on its, uh, on its government. And um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 23 uh, First Nation uh, candidates are on the ballot. And uh, I mentioned earlier as well that the cabinet committee that will look at uh, government decisions through the lens of First Nations. It's not my place to make cabinet posts, but I would expect that, that uh, uh, some of those um, First Nations MPs would uh, participate in that committee. The more I think about that question, the more multi-layered it seems to be. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay, please. Yes, my name is Lynn Hunter. I have the honor of being a member of Parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands from 1988 to 93. My, my question is for Elizabeth May. You have been quoted as being proud that the Greens will not be a whipped caucus, that you will be consulting with your constituents on each bill. How do you determine what your constituents want. Having been in that situation, it's very hard to know. Well, fortunately, as uh, everyone in this room knows, and it's great to see you again, Lynn, the voters of Spanish Gulf Islands are an incredibly engaged and uh, informed community. And in the last four years, so it's not what I, what I can do in the future, I can say from experience that I've been able to determine how the vast majority of voters in Saanich Gulf Islands feel through two methods. One is asking people through questionnaires mailed to every home through the uh, householder device, and we get a huge response rate. And the other is by holding regular town hall meetings. I've held 80 town hall meetings in Saanich Gulf Islands since May 2nd. to Elizabeth, but our rules of engagement do give others the opportunity. If you have someone to speak to this specific issue? Yes, on the issue of whip votes, and Ms. Hunter, thank you very much for your service in our parliament. <laughs> the Liberal Party of Canada, under Mr. Trudeau, has, as part of our policy platform, we will have no whip votes. The only votes that will be whipped will be confidence votes on financial matters. The other thing I'd like to tell you is that we'll have, we're, we're going to do away with omnibus bills. There'll be no omnibus bills. There'll be no prohibition. Realchange.ca. You'll see it all there. It's, it's really impressive. Well, as a member of local government with uh, about 16,000 people in Central Saanich, uh, it's very difficult for, for me with that to uh, determine the, um, uh, the, the voting preferences. What I said I would do before uh, people voted for me is what I do at council. And um, the, I, I think that in, in a party system where you've got your platform, you've got your policies, people are voting for uh, what you're committing to. And I think it's, it's much the same. 
Um, there's been examples, the bombing of Iraq and gun control legislation. There were two Green MPs. One voted one way, the other voted the other way. And uh, with all due respect, it's been noted to me that it's a surprise party. I don't think that's accountability. And I don't, I don't believe that uh, it's your, you know what you're getting uh, when there isn't a whip to vote. Thank you. There's a lot of energy in that question from everybody. Uh, this is uh, unsigned. Uh, the question is, uh, do you agree that whoever wins 39% of the vote should have 100% of the power? No. Green MVP liberal is our order. Uh, no. <laughs> do you agree that whoever wins 39% of the vote should have 100% of the power? <laughs> Obviously not, and even in our system of government, someone who recognizes, and bear in mind, again, we do not elect prime ministers. We elect members of parliament, and they have to find someone who holds the confidence of the House. In theory, that could be any of us after the election. It's only the overlay of political party structures that make it a foregone conclusion that if the Conservatives get the majority of the seats, or the NDP get the majority of the seats, we know who the prime minister will be. In this context, it needs to be clear that even a prime minister who wins a majority of the seats to his or her party should never have 100% of the power. This is an abuse of our system of government and represents turning supremacy of parliament on its head. We have a prime minister who presumes to be in charge of everything, including allowing scientists to speak, including what their backbenchers say, including what their cabinet members say including interfering with the building of evidence before decision-making. It's a monstrosity. Yeah, I think, um, let's not confuse what our parliamentary system is, which is first past the post, with the style of a leader. Um, as an HR person, I totally uh, appreciate what a leader can do for any organization. And I've had two opportunities to meet with Tom Mulcair, and uh, the first one was a very brief um, opportunity when he was here for a rally. The second was a, a coffee meeting up island. He not only remembers the personal details that I shared with him three months later, we had a really engaged conversation about, about uh, Sandwich Gulf Islands. I've also talked with people who've traveled with him throughout the campaign, and one of the most remarkable things is that he has a, a really close, long-standing group of people that have been working with him. And as a leader, if people are willing to stick it out with you, um, that's a really good sign. And you know, let's not forget that the NDP will implement first, or sorry, proportional representation, which will move us past this first past the post where 39.6% takes the leadership. That's the system we have. It needs to be changed. We all agree on that. There's no question. Our, our, our electoral system will change. Under a Liberal government, Mr. Trudeau has said that this is the last election where we'll have a first-past-the-post scenario. In the future, if we are fortunate enough to form a government, we will have a, a, a commission that will study the options. We're not going to say it's going to be proportional. We're not, we're not going to say it's going to be a fixed member proportional yet. We're going to say we, as a parliamentary, uh, all-party committee, will choose to see which is the best system for Canada. Not what is the best system for the Liberal Party, but what is the best system for our democracy. Hello everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm Teal Phelps Bondrop. I love the crowd here. It's fantastic. So thank you all for showing up today. My question relates to a comment Elizabeth just made and made yesterday on CFAX. You said that no conservative is going to win a seat on an island. And I was wondering if you could speak to whether this may suppress the vote in ridings like Courtney Alberni or Cow Jamal Lanford, where it's a very tight race between NDP and conservative. Well, it's good to see you, Teal. I had thought for quite a long time you'd be sitting up here, because uh, when we first met, I thought you were going to be an NDP candidate here. In any case, I don't think there is a tight race in any of those areas between
between a conservative and an NDPer. There are tight races between Greens and NDPers across Vancouver Island, which means people can, you know, keep calm and vote how you want. Because the conservative support on Vancouver Island has plummeted so far that John Duncan abandoned where he used to live to move down to Qualicum Beach, knowing he couldn't win a North Island Pell River, and he is polling well below your friend Gord Johns in Courtney, Alberta, and below where we are with Glenn Solid. So I don't see how that even, even if the premise of your question was true, which it isn't, how that applies to voter suppression is beyond me. People, we are encouraging voter turnout to go up. We are encouraging people, no matter how they're going to vote, to get out and vote. That's the message that I've been sharing on campuses across Canada. Well, we all know polls change, um, and oh, I did look at polls today, and five of the seven seats on the island, the second place candidate is a conservative, and uh, the other two, uh, this one included, there is a current polling. So, I, I don't think it's accurate. I think that the uh, that the NDP and the conservatives are, are uh, right now in the polls, and, and, and I do think that, that it's a bit misleading and uh, not representative. Thank you. If you're really curious about October the 19th. Mm -hmm. um, this is a written question, and this comes back to our theme of uh, energy, and it has to do with uh, pipelines and rail. And so this will be for all candidates. And uh, a recent report by the Fraser Institute examined data from Canada's Transportation Safety Board. The report found that oil shipments by rail are 4.5 times more likely to have a spill or an incident than those pumped through a pipeline. Given the fact that as a society we will be transporting oil and gas for another 50 years at least, should not we not be aware of the advantages of transporting oil and gas via pipelines? This is from Mr. Bill German. So this will be uh, Tim, Elizabeth, and Thank you, Bill, wherever you are. <laughs> I've already answered this question, and, and, but let me repeat that. The premise, the, the preamble on that is correct. Pipelines are safer than rail. It's almost a no-brainer. <laughs> We've seen the damage in Lake Magantic and we can't afford to have that happen again. Do pipelines have to be thoroughly regulated and maintained? Of course. And I think a, a National Energy Board and a Transportation Safety Board should be uh, responsible for doing that. It's about science, it's about engineering. Well, I think going forward, uh, an invigorated uh, NEB will uh, will help us look at the, these bigger questions. But I, I would um, I would suggest to you that this uh, low taxation policy of the Conservatives and this um, you know having a surplus is coming at the expense of our health and safety. Right? The we're we're not we um, the corporations are are pretty flush. But services in the rail, in terms of monitoring and maintenance and enforcement, is lacking. You know, we see this in Central Sandwich or throughout in, in the Sandwich Inlet. We've been uh, concerned about sewage dumping, and there are regulations in place right now that would prevent the problems that we're having. But guess what? They're not being enforced because there's no resources being allocated to it. So again, the NDP's solution, I would expect to rail, would be no different, and that is charging the corporations more and reinvesting that in public service to look out for your needs. Thank you. Thanks for the question. It's a complicated answer. Number one, Lock Meg Antique, the uh, pipeline industry was, I think, obscenely quick to claim that it would have been better to have pipelines. 
without bothering to inform people that there was no pipeline proposal anywhere for bringing North Dakota back in shale towards the East Coast. So there was no alternative, and we should not be shipping back in shale by pipeline or train. It's dangerous, and it's a huge greenhouse gas producer in North Dakota. The other aspect of this question is bitumen. Why should we be shipping raw bitumen at all? The weird answer is, raw bitumen without the diluent can be transported by rail more safely than by pipelines. The only way you get raw bitumen to be transported, uh, transported by pipelines is to ship the diluent up to northern Alberta, mix the substance together, and then you create a very dangerous material to ship. If you take the solid bitumen and warm it and put it into rail cars, if there's an accident, the bitumen doesn't move, it can't flow, and it doesn't blow up. It's absolutely inert. Oh. Well, first of all, I'm not trying to impersonate Robert Boyd. It's just an unfortunate coincidence that I dressed this way. Um, glad you like it. Uh, the same human resources used in the oil patch can be used in manufacturing. Why not have a G7 slash NATO treaty giving Alberta a quota of one third of the wind and solar uh, generation generators sold in Canada and the USA? In exchange, Canada would guarantee the EU all the petroleum products they currently import from Russia. Note, uh, pipelines in the EU's North Sea, which do not transport bitumen, uh, leak 1,000 times less, I'm actually quoting accurate statistics, uh, than Alberta's. A good model for manufacturing in Alberta would be Manchuria. Manchuria is dry, flat, and windy. And in the inevitable trade war with China, we will need all the allies we can get. I'm going to have to pass on that because. Oh, I, it's beyond my comprehension. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, well, I'm not sure that I followed the question and, and could accurate, uh, accurately answer it, but I'd be happy to chat with you to understand it more fully after. I, I think that I would take this opportunity, though, to say that with a national energy program uh, that is committing to reduce subsidies to the fossil fuels in the billions of dollars and redirecting that into clean uh, a transition to a clean economy, a low carbon economy. These are the kinds of things that, that we would be providing incentives to um, uh, businesses to, to move forward. And our commitment to free trade, uh, providing that it's done responsibly and not at the risk of, of Canadians' rights, uh, it sounds like th that this would be an opportunity, but um, uh, again, I'd like to chat with you more in, in after and, and understand your question more fully. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I know like, you've always brought brilliant ideas to town halls, mm -hmm. and I have to admit this time, I also am going to try to grasp, I think I just did at least most of what you're saying is that we could negotiate within allies in the G7, we could provide a guarantee to other countries, particularly in the European Union, who are looking to see Canada become a responsible player and reduce greenhouse gases, that we would be moving aggressively into wind and solar. That makes a lot of sense. It also makes sense that bitumen is a feedstock to other things besides uh, producing fossil fuels for burning. For instance, it's a feedstock to an industry that does uh, petrochemical products in the future. So in looking at the whole picture, if we think outside the box, which you are pretty much famous for doing in my town halls, we would be uh, able to perhaps negotiate some things with other countries and drive our own domestic energy plan in a different direction. It's the best I can do for now. <laughs> Okay, a written question um, from Hillary Strain, and um, the question is, what is your party's position on the LEAP manifesto? And I assume
assume that everyone here understands that the manifesto is a sort of visionary document that was put out by uh, uh, a large number of um, prominent Canadians. So, um, Green, Liberal, NDP. So far as I know, the Green Party is the only party to have endorsed the League Manifesto and signed on to it. I think it's a great document. I've been doing some more research on this. It's, it's a, a concept that's new to me. Thank you. Well, I hope it can be the, um, the firm commitment that Tom O'Care and the NDP has to move to a low carbon economy and to address climate change. And uh, um, Mr. Mulcair and the NDP think that this is an interesting idea and we're open to more debate. And we think that it's really healthy that there's discussion coming forward and that there's a, a, a real interest uh, building to move further in this direction. Thank you. The League oh, Manifesto? Yeah. I think I would suggest that, uh, first of all, you just uh, look at it on a search on the internet. But it was a document created by, um, uh, uh, I think, initiated by Naomi Klein and Abby Lewis, and signed on to by very prominent Canadian environmentalists, artists, writers, politicians. Uh, and that's really a forward-looking vision uh, in terms of the kind of world that we might want in seven generations. Really. Yeah. It's a quite encompassing document. Okay, Marion has some material on the LEAP manifesto. She could probably answer your questions about it too. A clarification? 30 seconds, yes. Just, I gave a very short answer and said we'd sign on to it. It was easy to sign on to because the League Manifesto was essentially what's already in Green Party platform and policy, but we're moving to deep decarbonization. That's the essence of it, that we take the leap forward to ensure that our pathway is to go off fossil fuels altogether. Mm -hmm. honor the two gentlemen who have been standing here for some time and give you a chance for your questions and then if there's the energy for uh, anything more from the written questions. Oh, actually we also have to give these guys a wrap up time. There's so. also a lady who's been standing oh. up. Oh, there's three of you there. Okay. Uh, two for six minutes for the wrap up. Um, I think that leaves us. No. Uh, let's see if we can do really quick. Question? Really, maybe, can we try for 30 second answers? Sure. Okay, sure. then we can do it, sure. I think. Hi, thanks, real quick. Uh, Mark Adams, small business owner, uh, family guy. And I, the GST was brought back in by Brian Mallory's Conservatives back in the 1980s. Uh, the BC carbon tax was brought in by BC Liberal Party's Gordon Campbell, uh, also many years ago. Uh, not bad ideas, but two big issues. One is the small business exemption of $30,000 has not changed since the days of Mr. Mulroney and Chicago. Uh, the other issue is, besides that we pay many dollars in carbon tax, we feel that every time we buy gasoline or anything, uh, none of this is coming back to, that's right, I'll try to be brief. Um, none of this is coming back to small business. What will you do to uh, keep people from having to run around dealing with, small, with, this, with the GST for small business? And also, what can you do for Helping us get solar panels on our roofs, uh, small businesses, and residences. Thank you. The answer is going to be shorter than the question. You have 30 seconds each. You are going uh, liberal, uh, green, NDP. Great. Well, first of all, the liberals are going to lower small business taxes uh, from 11% to 9%. That'll be helpful. But also, we're going to stimulate the economy with $125 billion of investment in infrastructure. That's going to mobilize small business in a way that it's never seen before. We're also going to uh, overhaul CRA so that it treats taxpayers more fairly. Uh, I did mention the 2% uh, tax reduction for small businesses. 
And uh, having owned and operated a small business, I appreciate what you're saying in terms of the complexity of, of the administration of, of the GST. Uh, it's nothing that I can commit to right now, but I can, uh, in terms of what might be done, but it's it's something I understand and it's something that I would commit as your MP to, uh, to look into that as well. Um, you know, I, th I think that uh, some other things for small businesses and innovation tax credit and, um, you know, the child care as well. As an HR person, I know how hard it is to hire and uh, that should put more people into the workforce. Well, thanks, Mark. I'll turn it over to We also reduced small business tax to 9%. We I brought forward a private member's bill that got on your paper, I'll bring it back, for an advanced assessment of any new government regulations or fiscal changes for their impact on small business. We will also raise the GST exemption. As you say, $30,000 came in a long time ago. It's time to revisit that and increase it. We also want to ensure that the small businesses benefit as well from the funding that's available and the programs for energy efficiency and renewables. Please keep your question as absolutely brief as possible. <laughs> We're really down to the wire now. Okay, my name is John Tilton. I'm a member of Small Business, which is Renewable Energies. But my question is not about that. My question is regarding the uh, use of the fossil fuels. We're not going to be able to use fossil fuels anymore to heat our houses and homes. And therefore, the CO2 burned by our trees and that. What are we going to do to heat our homes if uh, we can't use any product of carbon based? All right, we're going green, NDP, liberal, if you wish to respond. Hey, John, trying to make sure I understand your question. Are you, are you questioning whether we would allow homes to be heated with wood fuel? Because wood fuel does replenish itself and you're able to read the, the trees do pull carbon out of the atmosphere. We will be using phenomenal amounts of renewable energy, both tidal, wind, solar, geothermal, and advancing energy efficiency. We still waste more than half the energy we use in Canada. We have tremendous ground to gain by being energy efficient and embracing renewables. Yeah, um, we need to look past where we've been to where we will be, and that is with renewables. And then the tools that will help us get there are transferring the subsidies. The green bonds that I mentioned will also be available for uh, investing in, in new renewables, and um, this is the future, and it's bright. There'll be jobs, and there will be a lessened impact on our planet. Um, the, the, uh, the, we know by the fires and the droughts that we've seen just in this last season that um, the cost of not doing something is going to be higher, and moving in this direction is actually going to be very beneficial. I think you're right that we can't just stop. The transition away from fossil fuels should start now. And it has started now. We know that. This may refer to decreases in investment in fossil fuel industries. That's a, that's, that, that's, that's a sign that it's starting. We all have to take action personally. And we have to have a government that will lead by example. So we're going to move away from those slowly and gradually, but ultimately successfully. And we're going to have technologies that we'll invest in today that will bring results in the future. The very last question, short question, short answers, and we'll still wrap up on time. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Kim, and I'd just like to say a few things. For one, I don't believe in American politics of negativity. I think that Canada, we are a place of democratic people who are tactful and are diplomatic. I don't believe in going into debt after having a student loan and having difficulty in paying it. At the same time, I come from Alberta and I've lived most of my life there, which is where um, Stephen Harper is from and all the oil and everything else. I have friends and family that are supported by the, the oil um, and everything like that. And yet, I have a Bachelor of Science and I took my science degree in ecology at the same time that Elizabeth May was learning about cultural uh, climate change, when the scientists were saying, in 10 years, this is what's going to happen. And 10 years later, it has all happened. Can you to the question, please? My, my point is, I believe in democracy. I've been in Alberta, where nobody around me believed in what I did. 
And I thank everyone here, every single person, and, and Godward Initiatives and BC Sustainable Energy. For the first time in my life, I'm going to actually vote for someone that gets into Parliament. That's amazing. <laughs>
for having a chance to talk about climate in this election campaign. I had hoped to be talking about climate in the English language leaders debate, CBC, CTV, and Global. I've been invited to participate in that English language leaders debate, but unfortunately, it looks like it's about to be canceled, unfortunately. So, this may be my only opportunity in the election campaign. I want to focus on the reality that when I stand before you as leader of the Green Party and as someone who hopes to continue to represent you in Parliament, I have no problem being really clear about saying I will fight against fracking, I will fight pipelines, we can say no to tankers, we will say no to expansion of the oil sands, and those are responsible things to say. Unfortunately, some will say, well, you're against everything. So I want to take a moment to say no. Saying no to those things is saying yes to a whole lot of better things. Saying yes to jobs in clean and renewable energy. Saying yes to the work to retrofit our buildings. Saying yes to new technologies, to tidal power, to wind, to solar. Saying yes to a future for our kids where our future is secure and the climate crisis doesn't tip into self-accelerating runaway right global warming, which is my number one concern. We have the opportunity in 2015 to make that turnaround, to make that change. One of the quotes I love from it's a long time ago that, believe it or not, Sheikh Yemeni said, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> <laughs> but because we found something better. This is the time when we in BC and on Vancouver Island and on Sandwich Gulf Islands can lead the rest of Canada into a greener economy, a greener future, and much greener politics. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to thank all of you. I think standing for public office is uh, difficult and challenging and exhausting and uh, many other things besides. It's perhaps also exhilarating, yeah. um, but it's not easy to come here. And I also want to say I see that, um, that all of the candidates that we've been listening to this evening share a commitment to that seventh generation. And I think that um, we have a richness here and I really appreciate your willingness to come out and bring some focus to climate and energy in this uh, election campaign. And to all of you who are almost all still here, uh, two and a half hours yeah. on a Friday night, that's super great. Thank you for coming. And just a couple of very quick things. Um, on your way out, please stop by the Dogwood table to find out more about this is from Alexis, who was uh, introduced Dogwood at the beginning. Voter registration and recent changes to voter registration. Where to vote and advanced voting dates. And Dogwood's vote pledge and how you can help. So thank you again to the candidates. And thank you all for making this a really super and interesting evening.